Hi, I'm Meg, and welcome to the first ever episode of True Anomalies, Tales from the History of Science. This is an experiment in telling stories about science, about how it happens and who makes it happen. Today, shock and awe. Imagine a time when scientists were the life of the party. <laughs> Say what you will now, but that might not seem so strange if you were living in the 18th century. Say you're the king of France, for example, and you hire this guy, a scientist, to tutor your kids, and in the meantime, he sets up these awesome science demonstrations for your court. Like this one time, he comes in and lines up all of your guardsmen, all 180 of them, asks them to hold on to metal wires, and then, just by touching an ordinary glass jar full of water, makes them all jump into the air at the same time. He'd make a pretty good magician, right? His name was Abbe Nollet, and he was born a peasant, trained to be a clergyman, hence the Abbe title but heard about these cool new discoveries with electricity and worked his way up to study with the experts of his time. And by 1746, he was the author of the most accepted theory around to explain electrical phenomena, the Système Nolé. Just to clarify, this is super early, way before Tesla started working for Edison, more than a century before Maxwell came up with his equations. It's before Fourier's law, before Coulomb's law, and just one year after the Leiden jar was invented. That's the little jar that made the guardsmen jump. This was the age of the electric machine. Nolet and his colleagues built huge contraptions to help them generate static electricity for their experiments, like this one, which has a big glass ball on one end that gets spun around. By rubbing the glass as it whirls around, you can build up charge in one place. Here you might use a suspended metal bar, and then use it in controlled demonstrations. It's the same idea as walking across a carpeted floor in socks and then grabbing the doorknob. So why were they doing this? They wanted to find a theory that could explain all of the observations and tell them, once and for all, what is electricity? Whether it's a substance or a motion and how it moves and what its effects are, these things were all up in the air, and the community was divided in how to think about it. On the one hand, you had the mechanical worldview. Matter is inert, and it's pushed around by contact with other bodies or fluids. Its behavior can always be explained mechanically. This view was championed by René Descartes. The other side argued for final causes in nature, the idea that matter is endowed with inherent behaviors. In this view, forces can act at a distance without any mediating physical mechanism, and Isaac Newton became its poster child. The whole argument is about the nature of matter, whether it's totally passive or has some kind of active principle. Okay, it's too simple to say that every scientist believed one thing or the other thing, like black and white. Actually, there were as many varieties of each view as there were scientists. And even Descartes and Newton would have disagreed with some of the things their followers were saying about them. But there was a debate going on, and Nollet was right in the thick of it. His system fell firmly on the mechanical side. He believed that electricity is a kind of matter, a fluid, and it exists within everything. When you agitate a body, like when you rub the glass in the machine, it will throw off its electrical matter in jets, called effluent streams, while at the same time it's absorbing electrical matter from surrounding bodies, even the air, in affluent streams. According to Nollet, these streams are constantly balancing each other, so we never run out of electrical matter, and it's their motions that are responsible for the kinds of phenomena observed. Nollet used his electric machine for these serious experiments, but these devices were also being put to use in more amusing ways, to make up some pretty crazy parlor tricks. Like here, where you show that the human body conducts electricity by suspending a child in place of a metal bar. In this picture, he can hold his sister's hand and she starts conducting too. Or consider the Venus Electrificata, a game in which you invite a young woman to collect a charge by touching the machine, and then dare the men of your salon to try and kiss her. Shocking. Nollet's system did a pretty good job of explaining these types of observations in terms of incoming and outgoing jets of electrical matter pushing things around, but it wasn't perfect. One thing it really couldn't explain well was that pesky Leiden jar. This little jar presented a big problem for Nollet. So what is it? The Leiden jar is the earliest form of the capacitor, a really handy component of most modern electronics. It was invented almost by accident in 1745 when it applied an unexpected shock to a laboratory assistant. Here's how it works. Basically, you can set up a charge difference between the inside and the outside of the jar by filling it with ordinary water and holding it in your hand. You and the water are both electrical conductors, separated by the glass of the jar. 
The electric machine adds charge of one sign, let's say positive charge, to the water inside the jar, and negative charge builds up on the outside on you to balance it out. The jar is discharged when you get close enough to the water for a spark to bridge the gap, and then you get a nasty shock. That's exactly what happened in Nolay's demonstration with the palace guards. But the thing is, it only works if the outer conductor, that's you, is grounded. Because in order to build up the negative charge, your own positive charge has to leave the system, so it has to have somewhere to go. That's a really subtle point, but it makes a huge difference. Everything makes sense if you think of electrons being moved around, like we do today. But Nolay was thinking in terms of these jets of material going from the machine into the jar, and then? It doesn't make sense at all for the system to be grounded. If we're filling it with stuff and there's a hole in the bottom, why doesn't the electrical matter just flow out of the jar? Shouldn't it be insulated instead to keep it all in there? How do you reconcile the theory with these anomalous observations? Well, Nolay wasn't the only one doing experiments like this and thinking about their results. His biggest rival was Benjamin Franklin. Yes, that Benjamin Franklin. He still thought of electricity as some kind of fluid, but he had his own idea for how it worked. Instead of caring about the motion of the fluid, about how fast or where it was going like Nolay, he thought the important part was how much of it existed in any one place. So you could have an excess of electrical matter in one place and a deficiency in another, and he would call those two states positive and negative electricity. Now the total amount of electrical matter is always conserved, so according to Franklin, all of the phenomena that you see in the lab, the motions and the shocks and the sparks, are the result of these excesses and deficiencies actively trying to exchange with one another and come back to equilibrium. Franklin's theories put him firmly in the final causes camp. Thinking of it this way, the Leiden jar is like a spring. You can only add as much positive electricity to the inside of the jar as you can add negative electricity to the outside. And discharging the jar is like releasing the spring. It bounces back to its previous state. Sound familiar? You could argue that the way we understand electricity today sounds more like Franklin's understanding than Nolay's. We've got positive and negative charge, charge conservation, etc. Does that mean that Franklin won and Nolay lost? Well, it's not that simple, although Nolay's effluent and affluent streams haven't survived to the present. But lots of things have happened in between their time and ours, and it would be too easy to see them all as steps on the path to where we are today. Besides, who says we have it all figured out now? Nolay had one way of looking at the world, Franklin had another, and by debating their advantages and disadvantages publicly, they could find the places where things didn't quite fit, like the Leiden jar, and focus on them to figure out what was going on. That's right, arguments can actually be productive. Plus, no one really wins or loses, right? Because how exciting is it to do an experiment that tells you something you didn't know before? Especially an experiment that involves a huge demonstration for the King of France, a human chain of palace guards, and an electric machine. So remember that the next time you rub your socks on the carpet and sneak up on a friend. Or the next time you have some party games to plan.